Okay, so we have it recorded now um, for our Ask the Experts about the Brassicas. And like I said, uh, if anybody has any questions, you can put them in the chat and I will be watching those. Um, I will get to your questions um, as appropriate as we go through things. We've got a few preset questions that came in, so we'll ask those of our panelists. So with that, I will introduce our panelists and then they can tell you a little bit more about themselves, the roles they play in their company, what their company does. So we have Heather Kibble from Cicada and Jan Vanderheide from Bejo Seeds. So um, which one of you wants to go first to tell us about yourself and your company? I'll, uh, I'll kick it off, I guess, uh, if that's all right with you, Heather. Um, my name is Jan Vanderheide. I am the Northeast Market Manager for Bejo Seeds. Uh, we are a vegetable seed company and uh, our three main crops are uh, cabbage, carrots and onions. And so uh, cabbage is what we're gonna be talking about today. Uh, we're based in uh, Northwestern Europe in Holland, but we have uh, daughter companies all over the world. And uh, cabbage and cabbage crops and coal crops are grown all over the world. So uh, we, can, we have lots of things to, to offer and lots of things to talk about. Great, thank you. And Heather? Hi, I'm Heather Kibble from Sakata Vegetable Seeds. Sakata is based in Japan, but I work for the American division, which is based in California. Um, and I'm in sales and my sales division is called Homegrown. So I, Sakata um, breeds and produces vegetable seeds for many different crops. And um, I support the Homegrown division, which sells to um, home gardeners through like farmer's market type growers. Um, so sales and marketing, I guess, is my specialty and my um, area is the U.S. and Canada. So I know a little bit about a lot of crops. Um, and a lot of areas, so just enough to be dangerous. <laughs> uh, trust me, you, you both know a lot about brassicas. So since you're both working for breeding companies, what I would like to, well, okay, let's start at the really high level. Um, tell us a little bit more about brassicas. Why, why are they brassicas? Um, what, what crops do they include? Uh, what else can you tell us about brassicas? Here you go. Okay, I got myself unmuted again. Well, uh, brassicas is a, uh, you know, I see some of the questions are coal crops. What are coal crops? And brassicas basically are what we call the coal crops. Coal is an old English word for um, spring cabbage uh, or leafy, leafy greens in the mustard family type of thing. Uh, you can see that uh, if you're a linguist, you can see that in a lot of countries use things like uh, the words that are related to coal. Like in Germany, cabbage is called coal, K-O-H-L. As you, as you can see in kohlrabi, why is it spelled kohlrabi? Why is it such a funny spelling? Well, it's a German word. So it means um, a tuberous cabbage. Um, in uh, um, and, and even in our country, we use coleslaw uh, almost daily, I would say. And that word comes from that, uh, from that same old English word. Uh, that's a, a kind of a primitive cabbage that you can still find in parts of uh, Northwestern Europe. And especially if you went to uh, a seed company in England called Elsom's, they have a, a variety called spring cabbage. And if you were to Google that and look at it, it shows you some pictures of some of those wild cabbages that are growing along the coast. And uh, those were the kinds of things that people used to eat first thing in the spring when you know, you're just hungry and you, you'll eat anything. And, and uh, cabbage and, and coals uh, were very, very much in vogue uh, for that reason and very much in demand. Coal crops, uh, brassicas in general, are being consumed all over the world. And the nice thing about them is that they are easily domesticated. They are very nutritious, uh, very adaptable, and through breeding and, uh, and um, directed uh, selection, so to speak, 
uh, we have many, many different types. So there is loose leaf types like collards. There are, there are uh, flowering types like uh, cauliflower and broccoli. There are there's headed cabbage. There is uh, sprout cabbage like Brussels sprouts. Uh, there is kale. Uh, they're all part of the same species as everybody knows, and they readily interbreed. And you can get all kinds of funky hybrids, and it's uh, fun to do that. Uh, if you wanted to do that in your own garden, you can get, uh, you know, you can get um, um, like the kale, kale lettuce that a lot of people um, are familiar with. That's probably a, a cross between a kale and a Brussels sprout. Uh, there's pointed headed cabbages, there's flat cabbages, there's red, there is white, there's green, there's savoy. Uh, a very, very diverse group that is very important, nutritionally speaking, and uh, feeds uh, the whole world. Everybody, everybody around the world is eating a coal crop of some sort. And maybe uh, I think uh, Heather probably has a few things to contribute to that as well, because in, in Asia, of course, the, the Nebraskas are very important as well. Yeah, for many of the same reasons. And the only thing you pretty much covered it, <laughs> but the, the only thing I might add is um, Cabbage, especially historically, stores well. So that's another reason yeah. that it would feed people because you can, and you can still do that today if you have a good, cool harvest you know, or a good, cool storage location for after harvest. It's one of those crops where you can harvest it and be eating it, eating fresh food during the winter when it's you know harder to find fresh food in a lot of places. So I think that's probably another reason why it's um, these crops have been so important for so long in human history. Awesome. Um, we will save uh, some talking about harvest toward the end, just in the natural uh, flow in the life of a brassica. So at the end, maybe we can talk about some of those harvest and storage tips. Um, so do each of you have some favorite brassicas um, and why are they your favorites? And maybe you can tell us a little bit about that. Well, my favorite is, uh, I would say, a cauliflower. I have uh, very fond memories of my youth in uh, growing up in Holland. Uh, a cauliflower is served uh, boiled and then served with a, a little bechamel sauce on top of it and then a sprinkle of nutmeg. And I always enjoyed that combination of a, a nice meatball and some gravy, cauliflower and, uh, and new potatoes. Uh, just that's, that's my favorite. But another favorite I have to say uh, Chinese cabbage, Napa, is also very versatile and makes wonderful salads. Uh, Brussels sprouts, we've, we've, I've learned to hate Brussels sprouts when I was a kid, and I've learned to love them again now that we have uh, better varieties that are not as bitter. And uh, I'm, uh, I'm actually quite fond of Brussels sprouts as well. And uh, a good cabbage, you know, if you had to talk about cabbage, my favorite is a red cabbage uh, in the wintertime stewed uh, with some uh, some uh, cloves, uh, some apples. Um, and we often make, we take a head of the red cabbage and, and cook it up in a crock pot uh, on a Saturday. And then uh, we start eating it on a Sunday and then we have, a, we have it all throughout the week. And every, every meal that we have in the evening has a scoop of uh, stewed red cabbage on the side of it. And by the time the next Saturday rolls around, it's the last bit at the bottom of the pot. That is the very, very best. Uh, and the nice thing about red cabbage is it is full of antioxidants, especially anthocyanin. Uh, my goal is to live to 100, and I think I'm going to make it just by eating red cabbage. That's quite a testimonial there for red cabbage. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah sure. <laughs> oh, that's very good. Um, okay, Heather, what about you? What are your some, some of your favorites? I think pak choy is underrated in the U.S., certainly for home garden, because it's so easy to grow and quick maturing and then pretty. Um, I, <laughs> I like to grow it for how it looks, but also in some of our trials, ornamental trials, we'll put it in the edge of a flower bed just because it's so pretty, um, especially from above as you're walking by. But great, again, great for salads. Use the whole thing. It grows quick. You don't have to wait months and months for it to mature. Um, and the other one that we haven't talked about yet is collards. Um, I think collards are super important and traditional in my family. Um, the super healthy, but then also just one of those things that during the winter you can have on the stove. And uh, it's comforting to have warm vegetables cooking on the stove in the winter. Um, and then roasted Brussels sprouts, I must call out as well, <laughs> are another favorite. They're a little bit trickier to grow, um, but 
just as rewarding and then a great winter food too. Awesome. And one of the things I didn't mention in the beginning when I introduced myself, so I wear two hats, National Garden Bureau, All America Selections. So you might be hearing throughout here um, the mention of some varieties and we'll we'll call out some of the AAS winners. So I have to do that with the pak choy. Heather, you guys are selling one of our AAS winners, Asian Delight, right? Yeah, and it's it's especially pretty because of the rumpled texture of the leaves. So it's especially interesting to look at um, and bolt tolerant too, which if you don't, some people like bolting is the little flower that comes up the top. Um, and in some pak choys, you don't want that. But in this, and, and this is one of those, you don't want the little flowers. Um, others, people like to eat the little flower stock too. So there's something for everybody, I guess. But anyway, that one is bolt tolerant and um, holds really well and just looks beautiful in addition to being fun to eat. <laughs> yeah, I've put it in some of my ornamental containers before, just as another little element there peeking out. So yeah, yeah, one. just because people are like, oh, what is that? You know, it's interesting and different and any kind of green that you can uh, combine with flowers is interesting, I think. Also, um, another little tip we like to give out on the pak choys is to cut them in half and grill them um, during the summer. So I forgot to mention that when I was talking about salads. <laughs> I think if we have some time, maybe we can uh, do some special recipes, favorite recipes here at the end of, okay, we've got these brassicas, now what do we do with them? So let's let's remember that and get to that in the last few minutes. Um, so let's talk about, you, you kind of both have hinted um, at breeding, you work for breeding companies um, and what some are doing. Let's talk about that a little bit more, you know, so how does your company look at the home garden market. I know commercial is very important for both companies, but let's hone in on the home garden market and what, what is happening in the breeding world? Um, what are some of your breeding goals and why? Well, the main, the main breeding goals uh, for our company are the same uh, for all groups, that is large commercial growers, conventional and organic and the same thing of course for uh, the home gardeners and the, the small uh, roadside growers and things like that and that is um, reliable varieties that perform well uh, that have good good disease and uh, possibly also insect tolerance and that um, that fit a particular market need so if you are a home gardener maybe what you want is just a, a cabbage that is relatively small and and grows quickly and that you can eat fresh um, and those varieties exist because those varieties are very popular in Russia and Eastern Europe for instance uh, where a lot of cabbage is uh, used the way that we use lettuce uh, but maybe uh, just like Heather already said maybe you want to put a couple of cabbages away in the, in the cellar for winter time uh, and that those those that's a whole different type of cabbage uh, that's a storage cabbage which is very important for uh, the for the, uh, the the US most of the coleslaw that we eat is ultimately from storage cabbage because it means that it's available year round but maybe you like to make sauerkraut and if you like to make sauerkraut there are varieties that are specifically well suited for that uh, maybe you like to make cabbage rolls well then you need to have a flat cabbage that makes nice large leaves without uh, too many veins that are easy to roll up uh, heck maybe what you'd like to do is you'd like to uh, um, well, you can you can see there are many different cabbage can be used in many different ways. There isn't one cabbage. Well, you just put it this way. There is one cabbage that you can use for everything, but it's not ideal uh, for that. So I think uh, the offerings that both Cicada and Bijo and other seed companies have in cabbages, you as a consumer have to be a little bit uh, um, educated about what it is that you would you'd have to be clear have a clear idea about what it is that you want to do with the cabbage and then you have to educate yourself a little bit about which varieties are best suited for that and of course that's what the national garden bureau will help you uh, figure out but also uh, uh, various seed houses seed distributors like seedway or johnny's or high mowing seeds or uh, places like that can advise you on what cabbage is best for your particular purpose so in breeding we breed for we breed for all those different markets and for all those different purposes and uh, that's to the benefit of not only commercial growers but also home gardeners i would say good yeah thank you heather um your yeah. input 
Yeah, I would agree. So all almost all vegetable crops, I think I can put them all under one umbrella and say early maturity, um, disease resistance, pest resistance, if something can grow with using fewer resources in general, so whatever that means for that particular crop. Um, I think all the breeding companies have those as goals. And then from there, it narrows down to what particular crop you're talking about. So for broccoli would be another one in addition to cabbage. Um, the Say you want to harvest the crowns and have them store for a while. Well, that's gonna be different than something that you want to harvest today and also tomorrow and the day after that and the day after that, right? So those might be different varieties that you're looking for. Um, commercially, sometimes they want to harvest all at once in the home garden. Sometimes we like to harvest <laughs> multiple times because I don't necessarily want to harvest every single cabbage today. Um, maybe I'd like something that the, holds a little bit better in the field so that I can harvest one a week you know, through the season. Um, and that's true of a lot of different crops, not just cabbage or cauliflower, or broccoli. Um, so I guess to summarize, um, in addition to the earliness, disease resistance, pest resistance, um, extended harvest is important to me. Um, also flavor. So just because something holds well, if it doesn't taste good, I don't want to grow it. So <laughs> flavor is super, super important. And then it's a bonus, couple of bonus items and brassicas are famous for these. Um, usability. So for me, the more of the plant you can use without wasting. So it, it bothers me when I'm harvesting just some little part of the plant and then the rest of it goes to waste after I work on it for 90 or 100 days. You know, <laughs> I want to make the most of it. So I like crops that you can use every part of the plant. Um, and then what was the one other? Oh, pretty. Pretty is always good. If you're going to have it be a prominent part of your yard, then an attractive plant is important too. Yeah, that's very true. One of the things we've been talking about with both um, All America Selections and National Garden Bureau is Orna edibles. So, you know, bringing those vegetables from the backyard to the front yard or putting them in combination containers and, you know, just being able to enjoy the ornamental part of a lot of vegetables. And we're seeing a lot more of that these days. So I'm glad you brought that up. Thank you. Yeah. Um, oh, and one other thing you t you said taste. So like with all of our All America Selections trials, the number one thing we have our judges do is taste and talk about the texture because you're right. I mean, and this is a hard job for the breeders. They're, they're working on this disease resistance and this and this and you know, you got to remember the taste just just like roses for many years were bred um, for disease resistance and more flowers and all of a sudden the scent went away. Well, now the breeders are putting the scent back in. So yeah, yeah, that's important with the vegetable breeders also. So that's good. Um, so let's talk a little bit about growing of brassicas. I'm sure we have people on from all over North America. So we're probably talking South to far North to East to West. Um, so you can give some regional specific tips or uh, you know, some generalities for the type of soil they're growing in or temperatures and starting. So um, which one of you is going to start with that one? Ed, you want to start with that one? Sure. I'm in um, Southern California. So here we think of brassicas as fall or early spring crops, um, cooler weather, but that's different, obviously, as you go north. You know, there might be places where these are grown in the middle of summer. Um, but then also, um, so early maturity is super important for those of us in Southern California, or if you're in the South and your spring season is, you know, May 1st to May 10th <laughs> or whatever, some of the States get really hot, really fast. So, um, looking for early maturity crops will help you, you know, variety selection, I think is underrated for home gardeners. Be, be specific about what you're picking and try and find something that's suited to your area um, and you will have much more success. Um, yeah, I think we're gonna talk about pests later on. So I think I'll stick with that for now. Um, does that answer your question, Diane? Um, more or less, let's let Jan uh, give his side and then I'll see if I have any unanswered questions. Okay. 
Well, we're based in uh, New York State, uh, Northeast, basically. So uh, you deal with the New England states, the Mid Atlantics, uh, uh, Canada, Canadian provinces, the Maritimes, and things like that. And that's really the opposite of Southern California. We have really a summer growing season, whereas Southern California more of a winter growing season. And that has to do with the fact that uh, the winter here is too cold. You can't grow anything here because everything freezes uh, and uh, and dies fairly quickly. Uh, so we have to take advantage of a relatively short growing season from uh, early April till about uh, October. Uh, and we have to see if we can get all the onions and the carrots and the cabbages mature to put them in storage so that we can have something to eat for the rest of the year. But that means that um, in the summer, in the early spring, we can have some of the very earliest cabbages uh, mature in about 45 days after transplanting. And some of the latest ones that we meant for storage can take 120, 125 days. And that's just about at the end of our growing season. Um, if it gets too hot, the cabbage gets stressed. If it gets uh, too cold, it won't grow. It goes, grows very slowly. So you can see that uh, you know, broccoli in California probably takes about uh, 80 days to mature, where we can take the same variety matured here in about 45 to 50 days uh, in the Northeast, because we have uh, warm, warm, warm days and warm nights that uh, generates its own set of uh, challenges, uh, especially in things like broccoli. If it stays too warm at night, you know, if you have those nights where, you know, the weather is hot and sticky and you and your partner lay on the on the bare mattress in the middle of the night and you have this unspoken understanding that if you don't touch me, I will, will not touch you type of a thing. That's the kind of weather where broccoli really suffers and, and, and really does not do well. So uh, various cold crops have different degrees of uh, heat tolerance. Um, broccoli, cauliflower probably do better in the fall when the nights get cooler. Uh, but the regular cabbage you can produce uh, in the middle of the summertime, uh, even when the weather is hot and sticky in the middle of the night. So, yeah, it, uh, you know, you need a soil that is fairly uh, a bit on the alkaline side, ideally to help prevent problems with club root. Uh, fertility needs to be fairly high, but you, again, pay attention to the varieties. If you have a variety that's only in the ground for about 50 days, it doesn't need nearly as much fertility as something that's, that sits in the ground for 120 days. So you may have to spread out your fertility a little bit where you give uh, some starter fertilizer and uh, a basic fertility in the bed at the beginning, but varieties that stand in the, in the ground for a long time, you may have to feed them once or twice during the season to, to keep them happy and to keep them fed. Again, uh, that depends on what kind of a crop you're trying to, to raise because Brussels sprouts, you don't want to feed uh, past uh, the first half of the season because what you're really trying to do is you're trying to get that plant to die down and for those leaves to die off and then for the plant to suck the nutrients out of those dying leaves and invest those into the Brussels sprouts. And that's how you get a nice stalk of Brussels sprouts that is evenly sized and, and, uh, and evenly matured all up and down the stem. Uh, and it has no leaves left on it. So that naked stem that you that we're all looking for, uh, you will not get if you keep feeding that plant because that plant will keep making leaves and not making sprouts. So there's there's um, there's easy to grow brassicas, brassicas and there's brassicas that are a little bit more tricky to grow. And I would say broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cauliflower have their uh, little secrets. And uh, there it's very important that you that you choose varieties that are forgiving. Whereas cabbage, you know, if you can't grow cabbage, then, you know, um, you can always grow grass, I suppose. <laughs> so as I was listening to both of you, I'm kind of thinking, and and John, Jan, you did a, a pretty good job there. I'm wondering if we should kind of break things out by um, by specific crop to give some tips. So, so why don't we do that? Um, I've got you on. So Jan, why don't you give some tips about growing Brussels sprouts, since they're not the easy ones, um, start to finish, would you do transplants? Would you do direct sow? Um, and you would mention, you know, quit feeding after a certain time. So let's, let's continue on that with a few tips for Brussels sprouts. Yeah. Well, what you often see is that, you know, we talked about temperature ranges, uh, Brussels sprouts really don't like uh, don't grow very well in the heat. So where you see where Brussels sprouts are typically grown, England is a big place, uh, uh, northern Germany, Denmark, uh, uh, the, the, the maritime provinces, uh, Quebec, uh, uh, Vancouver area, uh, that's where the big Brussels sprouts uh, are, uh, acreage is. Also, uh, the cooler regions of uh, California, the coastal regions, the same regions where the broccoli and the cauliflower is being grown. 
uh, that's where that works. But if you are in an area where the summer gets really hot, uh, it's very difficult to grow a good crop of Brussels sprouts. Brussels sprouts uh, needs to grow at a nice, even and steady pace. Every time that you have an interruption of growth, uh, stress, you basically, uh, you're creating difficulties for the, the plant to regulate its own growth. And as you know, with Brussels sprouts, all the Brussels sprouts are basically side buds. And those side buds are just waiting for an excuse to do their own thing. What you really want, you want to keep order in the, in the Brussels sprout plant. And that's the top bud is the boss and everybody else is subservient and is is secondary. So nobody can get a mind of their own, but if the plant gets stressed and the top bud doesn't grow anymore, that hormonal suppression of the development of the side buds is lost. And then with, that's when you get this really uneven development of sprouts. So the bottom sprouts are really big and bloomy and they get alternary on them and, and bacterial disease and the top sprouts haven't even started to grow yet. So you get this Christmas tree effect. So, uh, you can alleviate quite a bit of the stress on Brussels sprouts in the summertime with irrigation. So you can, uh, what, what we often don't recognize is that Brussels sprouts are just as stressed as the lettuce and just as stressed as the, as the, uh, the pumpkins, for instance. But, but, you know, those, the lettuce and the pumpkins get water first because they wilt. They start wilting at 10 o'clock in the morning. And so they get water. Whereas the Brussels sprouts keep a stiff upper lip and they, uh, they, don't, they don't wilt, but at the same time, they don't grow either. So Brussels sprouts, what you're trying to do in areas like New York, um, in the beginning of the season, you give them a lot of fertilizer and you try to get them as tall as you can, as quickly as you can before the heat sets in. And that length is something that you're going to have to uh, take advantage of later on in the season. But the longer you can get, the taller you can get the Brussels sprout plant, the better yield you will have in the end. Then you're gonna go through a period with stress that you can maybe alleviate with some irrigation, but there's not gonna be a lot of growth at that point. And then when the nights get cooler again in the fall and the daytime temperatures are not so hot anymore, then you get more growth and then those Brussels sprouts begin to mature. Now you have a wide range of varieties that are from ranging from early maturity to very, very late overwintering types and that sort of stuff. Um, in our area where we have severe winters, don't do that. It's just, it's just uh, an exercise in futility. But um, in, uh, in, in the Northern European areas where you have relatively mild winters, England, for instance, um, you can grow Brussels sprouts. You can have Brussels sprouts that you don't harvest until March, they overwinter quite well. But in our area, probably something that matures in about 100 to 110 days is probably where you'd want to be. Uh, and then uh, because you gave the plant a lot of fertilizer up front, you got a lot of length. And now the second half of the season, the plant basically has to use up whatever fertilizer is left in the ground and basically you run out. So there should be nothing left at the end of the season. So that means that forces the plant to uh, relocate the nutrients in the leaves. So the leaves end up yellowing and falling off and reinvesting those nutrients into, into the developing sprouts. And that means that there is not so much nutrients that the sprouts are going to get bloomy and blow up. And there's also not so many nutrients that the plant keeps making leaves and is inhibiting the natural development of those, those really uh, uniformly filled uh, stalks of Brussels sprouts. So Brussels sprouts is something that you want to you want to grow them on ground that is not too fertile, because if the ground is too fertile, then you know you can't you can't slow down the growth. Uh, it can't be too poor either. But you know you're basically using your nutrient management to help guide the crop through its development. And uh, uh, it's probably going to take you six, seven, eight years before you figure out how to grow good Brussels sprouts. And that's why there's so few commercial growers that actually grow Brussels sprouts because it's very it's a, it's a challenging crop. Yeah. But we have but we have very good variety, so I think even home gardeners can and do do quite well. And if you have to pick some of the bottom sprouts first before the the top ones develop, that's fine. You know, then that way you can have multiple picks. I was going to ask that if you could pick some of the ones at the bottom, you know, as they're getting yep. large, and then just wait for the others. Okay, yeah, that's yep. that's yep. a great yep. tip. Um, so, Heather, what what do you think is one of the more um, challenging crops to grow in the brassicas, other than Brussels sprouts? And which one would you like to address? Yeah, so broccoli can be a little tricky for people as well. Um, maybe not quite as complicated, but certainly more complicated than cabbage or bok choy or some of the others we've talked about. Um, I have to plant super early where I am, and that would probably, 
be true for a lot of people in the southern part of the U.S. Um, other places, it makes more sense to plant in the fall. Here, it can be 100 degrees in October, so <laughs> that's not a great time either. So here, um, I start early in the spring, so that might be February um, or March, depending on how the weather's going. Um, I've been in my current garden seven years, so I've been working on the soil the whole time, and I think you can't undervalue your soil, and that sometimes is why it takes six or seven or eight years. The first year you garden, you may be very excited, but if you're working on soil that, you know, maybe has been dormant or just had grass on it for a long time or, you know, whatever has sat empty. Um, I think mine had a lot of construction <laughs> debris and such in it. So it wasn't great. And it seems to get better every year that I'm working on it. So adding compost and mulch is mostly what I do. So for something like broccoli, it has a pretty deep root system. Um, so the, the better your soil, the better your crop is going to be, I think. Um, I would transplant and I would find the early maturity varieties are just the way to go for this part of the country. Um, and then uh, one thing, broccoli, if you look for a variety that's early and one that says that it sets side shoots um, for a home garden, you can pick the central head of the broccoli as soon as it's ready and a good size and then leave the plant and you'll get side shoots, um, which are good. They're a little smaller. They're not exactly what you're used to seeing in the grocery store, but the flavor is there. And then that gives you that extended harvest that I was talking about. Um, which is nice. And you also, after time, can harvest the stem. Um, we were talking about the flexibility and using how many different cabbages there are. Well, there's broccolis for different purposes too. And an up and coming one has been um, stem use in <laughs> commercial broccoli crops. There, if you see broccoli slaw in the grocery store, um, that's those stems because a lot of the nutrition is in the stem and the leaves of the broccoli plant. So you can do that in your home garden too. Um, you can harvest basically the whole plant above ground and be using that. I like to peel the tougher outer layer, but uh, another underrated <laughs> benefit of the garden is broccoli stems after you've, um, you know, it's, it's finished setting the side shoots. Um, yeah, so that's broccoli cauliflower, pretty similar, a little bit more complicated maybe because you're waiting for a more central head usually, but um, a lot of the cauliflowers I think will set side shoots as well. And what about, um, do you have to cover the cauliflower head with the leaves in order for no. it to be white? All modern varieties are self-blanching. So unless you're planting an heirloom from the 1800s, it's probably got, which you might be, I mean, they're still out there, but for the most part, cauliflower is self-blanching, meaning it's got leaves that are going to wrap around it and cover it. And if one, you know, if you're in like where I am and you're in a not perfect area for cauliflower and say in May you get a heat wave and some sun hits it, um, it's going to turn a little yellow, but it doesn't hurt it, right? So <laughs> it's still fine. Um, but for the most part, the leaves keep it wrapped and keep the sun off of it until it matures. So, but if you are concerned about that, then look for the word self-blanching on the variety packet or label or description. I'm glad you brought that up because I was going to ask both of you, um, so, you know, a home gardener and I'm looking through the garden catalogs and the websites, will they be specifying a lot of these things you're talking about? I, I understand the early maturing and we look for the dates to mature. Um, will they say this one is great for winter storage? This one is great for self-blanching? You know, do, yeah. do most yeah. of the reputable uh, seed suppliers mention all that on their website? Yeah, for sure. Uh, where there's people like me out there writing those <laughs> painstakingly <laughs> writing those descriptions to try and get. Now, usually we only have a paragraph's worth of space, right? Because you can't, you don't want a seed catalog the size of the phone book. Um, but in a paragraph, we try and get all those important characteristics in, and they have a little more flexibility on websites a lot of the time um, to get more information about the varieties. But yeah, look for a company that gives you more information if that's important to you. Look for a packet that has, you know, a little fold out and a longer description and more um, information. And then also you can do additional research um, on varieties in general. And a lot of the time your local college or gardening group will have grown different varieties for your specific area. And they'll say, hey, here's one that works in this valley that you happen to live in. Mm -hmm. um, and that can be really helpful too to get you a head start so that you've got a 
great crop in five years instead of eight. <laughs> you know, if you can eliminate the first few mistakes that people make. Um, and you get what you pay for to some extent. So if you just pick up some seed that just says cabbage on it in the grocery store, you know, maybe you're going to have a fantastic crop of cabbage, but maybe not. You know, you don't know that that's necessarily been selected for your specific area and growing conditions and the way that you're going to use the crop. So. Uh, yeah, yeah, good point. You get what you pay for. So you're going to have a lot more information and probably better quality. So that's, yeah, that's good. Um, I had written down here, somebody had asked about, is there any brassicas you can grow in part, part sun, part shade, however you describe it, or do all brassicas really need full sun? Um, ideally, uh, brassicas get full sun, but um, especially if you're talking about the leafier types, um, under lower light intensity, you actually get probably get a little bit milder flavored uh, leaf. So if you plant kale in part shade, and of course part shade means um, not under a tree that sucks all the nutrients out of the ground, and then you end up with dwarf kale plants. But if it's just a shadow of a house or something like that, or or a, another kind of a structure, um, it's it's uh, you probably end up with, with uh, kale that is more tender and a little bit milder flavored. So um, as long as there's enough light for the to, to support the growth of the plant, and uh, even in uh, in diffuse light, they will grow just fine. We have to keep in mind that uh, you know a lot of countries where cabbage is grown, there's a lot of uh, cloudy weather, foggy weather, that kind of stuff. So uh, not all cabbage gets full sun all the time. When not everybody lives in the desert. Yeah, yeah, and and it made me think uh, when Heather was talking about the pak choy. Um, so pak choy kale, especially if you're growing it for baby greens, you know, I mean, I'm I'm sure you can use some of your less sunnier spots to do that when you're gonna harvest it and eat it as small leaves. So that's that's a good good tip. Great. Yeah, a lot of the places where these things grown are coastal communities, so there's cloud cover. If you think about Salinas, where a lot of your broccoli and cauliflower that you get in the grocery store comes from. Um, there's cloud cover there almost every day. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it doesn't always have to be full sun, but it helps. And it depends on where you are too. Like I grow kale and part shade and you're right. It's sweeter, I think, because it's got some shade from a tree that's pretty far away. It's not directly under the tree, but say four or five hours a day, there might be some shade in the morning and then a great afternoon sun. And the time of day that you're going to have the shade can be important too. Yeah. Um, if it's all afternoon in the summer, then that's going to slow the plant down more than having a little bit of shade in the morning. Okay. So I think it's time to talk about our friends, the pest. So, oh my goodness. Um, what are some of the common ones? I'll just say that I, yeah, no matter what brassica I plant, and if I happen to not go out to my garden for 48 hours, they're gone that something just eats them every single time. And I don't know if it's a pest or if it's an adorable little bunny, um, but let's just talk about some of the things that impact all brassica crops. And if you need to be specific, you can. Well, it starts with the flea beetles first thing in the spring, right? So uh, you know, everybody has ever planted arugula will know that uh, arugula is a favorite of flea beetles and they get all these little holes in it. And every you know, pak choy is quite susceptible to it, but all the other cabbage plants are susceptible to it too. And I'm just talking about Northeast experiences, of course. But, you know, uh, flea beetles are particularly active first thing in the spring. And uh, later on in the season, uh, we see far fewer of them. But then there, of course, the flea beetles are followed by uh, uh, imported cabbage worm. Uh, those green things that you can't see until you actually, uh, they fall off your fork after you steam the broccoli. And then, uh, and uh, yeah, they, they uh, you, what you probably know, notice that you have that pest is that you, you get a lot of holes in your leaves and then you start looking for where those pests are. What you can probably see too is that you're sitting there uh, nursing a beer in the afternoon, looking over your garden, and you see these little white butterflies flying over your cabbage crop. And they said, "Oh, we're getting, uh, we're getting uh, these, these these things are laying eggs, so we're going to have to be uh, particularly uh, mindful of uh, trying to control those worms if we can." And it's actually quite easy to do. There's these uh, uh, natural products, these bacillus uh, products, BT products that uh, that work very well for most of the worm pests. Uh, another issue can be thrips on headed cabbage. Um, 
it doesn't really hurt the cabbage, but it, they can get a little ugly and get a little scurfy looking, especially when they're over mature. Uh, but um, those are very, very difficult to control. And quite frankly, for home gardeners, uh, it detracts a little bit from the visual appearance, but you can always trim a leaf or two uh, to get rid of them, uh, to, to get rid of some of the damage. And I think um, from insects, from an insect perspective, that's pretty much it. Um, bunnies, uh, mice, voles, uh, groundhogs, deer, uh, the neighbor's dog, <laughs> all that sort of stuff, they can do considerably the damage to, uh, to gardens in general. Uh, and uh, I'm sure that uh, most gardeners have dealt with one kind or another and figured out that fencing, uh, exclusion netting and things like that work quite well. And exclusion netting, like floating row covers, can also work very well to protect uh, especially your young crops from some things like flea beetles or, uh, or uh, imported cabbage worm. Uh, and because of a little less, less light, uh, quite often what you see is those crops are actually uh, more tender and uh, more lush under a row cover than where they than if they were to be exposed to direct sun. So I think um, there's a, there's lots known about cabbage pests. And uh, I think that we all realize that the pests are here to stay and we have to learn to live with them. So there's, you know, 95% of the arborescent crop is for us and the other 5% is for the other creatures. That's good. And I do have two specific questions, but do you want to add anything to that first, Heather, before I ask my specific questions? Yeah, I'm uh, slugs and bunnies where I am. So <laughs> um, slugs in everything that I grow in the early spring, basically, because it's cool and damp here in the winter and spring. Um, so clearing the area, sometimes they hide underneath mulch or other plants or whatever. So if you have a clear area where there's not as many hiding places, um, that really helps. Uh, I used uh, clear domes has really been helpful when I first transplant something, your point about you come out the first day or two and it's disappeared completely. A lot of the time that will keep um, some of the pests off. And then I used to have a cat that would lay on <laughs> new transplants as well. So if you've got some sort of cover, a dome to keep critters off of it, the first, you know, until the plant can get established, that's really helpful. And bunnies sometimes eat the whole plant, but generally I've noticed they seem to nibble and leave the growing point. So a lot of the time it'll come back. So don't give up there. Self pruning, um, right? The bunnies yeah, are doing the pruning. Yeah. <laughs> and then just be observant. Um, a lot of the time you'll think it's one thing and it's really something else. So uh, COVID ha has been good for being home and being <laughs> able to go and check on your garden a lot. Um, I normally travel a lot for my job. So I, I miss, like, I wish I had a camera so I could see what ate the lettuce crop or whatever it is. Um, but the more that you're out there, the more different times of day. So you'll see like slugs are first thing in the morning, but you come out in the middle of the afternoon and there's nothing there. The plant's just gone. So um, be observant and that will help you figure out what's going on. Um, and then also local master gardener groups, or if you have a good, find a good nursery or somebody there knows about your crops, um, you can take a leaf in or a picture. Pictures are really good. That way you're not bringing them some disease. Um, take lots of pictures and go in and find a neighbor or another gardener that lives in your area and they'll be able to help you figure out, yeah, that's a slug or that's this, you know, cabbage worm or that's a bunny <laughs> and help you figure out what to do about that. Yeah. Okay. So for um, bunnies, it's fencing. Um, you had said uh, you use a cloche. Do you use a glass cloche? The cost of those was really prohibitive. Um, and so I found plastic ones, but I think the floating row covers are probably usually a better solution. Um, I just didn't like how they looked. <laughs> and that was going to be one of my questions about the yeah. floating row covers. I mean, I'm, yeah. I'm a seamstress. I sew. Is there other fabric you can use or does it really have to be non-permeable fabric so that these tiny little pests can't get through? So is that the key to a row cover? Yeah, I would buy something that's specifically a fabric chosen for that purpose um, because of letting light and water and insects through. I think something that you bought over the counter and tried to sew yourself wouldn't be as good. And that goes for netting and other things too. Now shade, if you're trying to make shade, 
have at it, you know, figure <laughs> you can buy something and try and figure that out. But for the floating row covers, I would buy something that's specifically for that purpose. Okay. Um, and we have a question about Harlequin bugs are quite a brassica pest in Tennessee. So do either of you have any experience or tips on how to control Harlequin bugs? Um, we work with the, with the project here at Cornell. Uh, it's actually kind of a, an, an East Coast project, the Eastern, Eastern Broccoli Project. And I talk to the project coordinator once in a while because we run some uh, trials together with them. And uh, I've learned about the Harlequin bug through that project. We don't have it here in New York State, although it's probably a matter of time before we get some of that here as well. And I know that in the uh, Tennessee, uh, mid-Atlantic, uh, the Harlequin bug is a real pest. And um, short of insecticide, I don't really know how to, uh, what to recommend for that uh, to, to keep that off. Floating roll cover would work would work. But again, um, like Heather said, you got to get those covers on early before the pest finds the crop and, and be vigilant that, uh, that there's no holes or anything like that. Sometimes the trick with floating row covers is if it's, if the pest is already there, then you are creating a perfect environment for them to breed. And, uh, you, you know, you think your crop is growing well until you pull the row cover off and you see all the damage that they've done. So yeah, I, I don't really have any any strong recommendations for Harlequin bug, but I know it's uh, the you know the various uh, university uh, and, and and extension systems um, probably have put recommendations out there, but they're m most likely insecticide based. Yeah. So yeah, that's that's one of the things we like to say, and Heather mentioned it is uh, go to your local extension office, see what they recommend. Um, so back back on the row crop, row cover, because I I'm determined I'm going to have some successful brassicas. So you put your transplants out, you immediately put the row cover over them, and then at what point can you remove this row cover, or can you? Does it have to stay until you harvest? No, it, it depends on. Uh... You really the young plants are the most vulnerable, right? So especially if you're talking about flea beetles early in the spring, the flea beetles can you know can decimate these young transplants uh, in the matter of just a day or two. Uh, you know, um, cutworms is another one that you know especially early in the spring could be. But you know, uh, making a little collar out of a out of a uh, you know milk carton or something like that to put around those plants is very effective to keep them from uh, from coming in. But um, the row covers to keep flea beetles off and to keep uh, worms off. Um, are only needed until those plants are beginning to grow well and strong. Uh, at some, at once, once a plant is strong enough to support itself uh, and to um, and to begin to thrive, uh, it is also strong enough to support quite a quite a load of of uh, insects that feed on it. Uh, in nature, you know, all the insects that are flying out there are feeding on the trees, and the trees don't seem to be dying. Yeah, every once in a while, you have a bad outbreak of a gypsy moth or something like that that kills a few trees, but for the most part. Um, plants are designed to have plenty of capacity to feed themselves and everything else that feeds on them. But you know, when the plant is really, really young, uh, that can be uh, that can be the death blow. And so you try to avoid that. Okay, great. Um, so let's talk a little bit about harvesting. Um, we talked about broccoli, where you can cut the middle stem and then any side shoots. Cauliflower might be the same. Um, and basically I'm assuming it's based on the size of the head is how, you know, when to harvest, use a clean knife. That's always a good tip. Any other tips on cabbage and broccoli? And then maybe we can go to some of the other crops too for harvesting. Yeah. Well, best quality is always when it just a little bit before maturity, right? If you, uh, if you harvest crops that are over mature, you probably end up having spots on them, uh, strips damage, uh, maybe some decay here and there. And that really uh, imp has an impact on visual appeal of those crops. And it uh, also uh, makes those crop crops uh, quite susceptible to decay after storage uh, or, or during storage. So uh, harvest uh, slightly immature if you can, because that's usually the, the cleanest and the and the highest quality produce. But uh, we all know that, uh, you know, you can only eat so much. So at some point or another, you're probably gonna end up harvesting some produce that's a little bit over mature. You'll have to do some trimming, but uh, if produce is over mature, don't uh, expect that it's going to last a long time. So if produce is over mature, you have to find a way to preserve it, uh, freeze it, uh, can it, make sauerkraut or eat it soon. 
Okay, Heather, do you have any harvest tips for anything else? Um, yeah, so I agree with all of that. Plus make soup when yeah. <laughs> cauliflower, broccoli, they make lovely soups. Um, cauliflower is pickled really well. Like there's Italian pickled cauliflower is one of my favorites. Um, so yeah, and then wait for the next group. And if something that you're going to store, you want to use your most pristine you know, best harvested items for your storage. And then the other ones eat quickly and don't try and store as long. Um, yeah, but you'll be amazed at new recipes you can learn where you may not go buy, you know, five pounds of broccoli in the grocery store to make soup. But if you find yourself with five pounds of broccoli in your <laughs> kitchen, <laughs> all of a sudden you'll find some recipes for it. Um, freezing is another good one too. I forget if we mentioned that, but yeah. Um, I don't always feel like, cooking things in the middle of summer when I'm harvesting. So I will freeze things for later on when cooking sounds like a better idea. <laughs> I literally started a Pinterest board called Gardens Bounty. So on the occasion that I do have five pounds of broccoli, then I've got my my broccoli recipes and cucumbers and things like that. So that garden, my garden bounty page is definitely yeah. uh, where I go to when I have excess like that. Yeah, because it can be overwhelming. Like right now it's peaches. I'm buried in peaches. So, but during the winter when I'm craving peaches and didn't have any, I have pinned things and saved recipes and have all kinds of ideas about how to use them um, when all I can do is keep them off the tree <laughs> harvested. So yeah, good point. So overall um, with, with all brassicas and probably, well, we'll just say, we'll just keep it to brassicas now is um, harvest, you know, if you're in doubt as to whether or not it's mature, you're always better off to harvest now than wait because mm -hmm. the flavor will be better and, you know, it might start to turn, you know, the broccoli will get those little florets or something. So yeah, yeah. harvesting younger is, is good advice. Um, yeah. With all brassica that I can think of, I yeah. almost like most of them can be harvested as a baby leaf product. So you almost can't be too early with just about everything. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. That's, that's probably the better tips. Um, so we have about four or five minutes left. Um, you talked about some of your favorites, but let's see here. Um, I think you had mentioned Brussels sprouts, like roasted. That's the way I do mine. Oh my gosh. And I let them get a little brown. They get sweet. You know, that's one of my good things. Uh, Jan, you mentioned the red cabbage in a crock pot. What kind of seasoning do you put on that? Uh, it's a, quite simple, a little salt. Um, um, and then um, you can you can add a little bit of uh, brown sugar if to, to kind of help sweeten it up. I like it with cloves. Uh, some people uh, add a little bit of red wine, but the idea basically in the crock pot, uh, you cook it low and slow and uh, uh, it, 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 the, the flavors have to have to have to uh, blend and have to melt. Um, some people like to add a little um, sour apple to it. Uh, the interesting thing about uh, red cabbage, the, the red cabbage uh, juice, it's it's kind of a pH indicator. So if you're ever looking for um, uh, a way to to test something whether something is alkaline or acid, the red cabbage juice is actually quite good. And this is the reason for why you are adding. Uh, sour apples or sometimes just uh, a little red wine or maybe some vinegar because that will help really brighten up the color. Uh, red cabbage juice is bright red under acidic conditions and it is blue under alkaline conditions. So when you are taking your cabbage, your red cabbage uh, utensils that you use to serve your cabbage and you rinse them off under the, the tap water, which quite in, in our area is uh, slightly alkaline, the red cabbage turns blue immediately. It's really interesting, really interesting to see. So, um, you know, um, all of these, these uh, a lot of brassicas um, you will find in Nordic cuisine, right? So uh, you get a good Scandinavian cookbook and you look for a basic stewed red cabbage recipe. Uh, that's the one you want. Um, at the same time, uh, as we already said, cabbages are uh, or brassicas are popular the, the world over. So there's lots of Asian recipes that uh, use brassicas. There's Afri Af Africa has a, a huge uh, culture of brassicas, especially uh, colored leaves, those kinds of things. And, uh, you know, we have Southern style cuisine. We have Northern style cuisine. It's, there's the, the sky is the limit really. But um, yeah, I think the red, red cabbage to me is always a, 
for, for winter is just delicious. Excellent. And Heather, any other closing thoughts from you on cooking with brassicas? Yeah, so I shared my pak choy salad. So that I just chop and goes right into salads. Um, the green cabbage is also good roasted like you would Brussels sprouts. Not everybody realizes that. Mm -hmm. um, we make a lot of coleslaw with it in the summer, but in the winter, definitely roasted. And I like to buy, um, there's little a little jar and it's harder to find in California because I think it's a Southern thing, but a little jar full of vinegar with these teeny tiny peppers that are pickled in the vinegar and that sprinkled on green cabbage. There's something about the combination of vinegar and cabbage. I think that's just magical. Yeah. Um, so spicy green um, vinegar on top of roasted cabbage is a favorite of mine in the winter. But yeah, coleslaw in the summer is you can't beat that for barbecues and things. <laughs> yeah, that sounds good. And yes, I do the cabbage steaks and I put like a little garlic butter on them and sprinkle with Parmesan. Oh, yeah. I, I think it must be close to noon around here. I'm getting yeah, hungry, hungry with all this talk <laughs> of brassicas, but uh, yeah, that's awesome. Um, so what I always do after we wrap up one of these webinars is I send the recording out to everybody if they want to listen to anything. And then I um, send additional links if I have them. And a couple of years ago, National Garden Bureau had the year of the brassica. So I can send a link out to that article as, as well as um, some of the varieties we feature featured that year. And you can always look on ngb.org at our plants and see what kind of brassicas we have that are new from the breeders that were on our panel. So I think with that, um, Heather and Jan, I thank you so much. And if I'm ever in your area, I will come over for a brassica dinner, yeah. no doubt. Yeah. <laughs> that would be fun. Um, Please but do. Yeah, but uh, yeah, we thank you. We thank everybody who um, attended our webinar. I learned a lot. I swear I'm going to be more successful with brassicas in the future. Um, thanks to you guys and row covers. That's that's definitely the key, it sounds like, is, is I need to buy some of those. So, so thank you. Um, have a great afternoon. Have a great day, everybody. And again, thank you to Heather and Jan for being our experts. Thank you very much. It's fun. Yeah, it was fun to be here. Okay, thanks and goodbye.